So just by a quick show of hands, who here have seen the Too Many Cooks video? We've got like, yeah, that's, that's a good enough percentage for now. So we're just gonna hit it off. A pinch of salt and laughter too A scoop of kids to add the spice A dash of love to make it nice And you got too many cooks 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 Too many cooks, too many cooks. of you uh, who have no idea what you just saw. Um, Too Many Cooks is a TV skit um, that went viral uh, a few months ago. And uh, we liked it. You should watch it if you haven't. <laughs> so if you've seen it, you can enjoy some references throughout this presentation. So if you haven't, then you can just laugh at the funny pictures. <sighs> okay, so um, who are we? So we're the Malware and Vulnerability Research Group at Checkpoint. Um, what do we do here? Uh, we have this uh, marketing slogan uh, that says we secure the internet and we actually try to do that by finding problems, telling the vendors and sharing them with the community, which is exactly what we're trying to do here. So uh, let's talk about what's in store for today. Um, we're going to very quickly go through what TR69 is um, and explain a little of what we talked about last DEF CON. Uh, which will lead us to the motivation behind the research that we're presenting today. We'll talk about the, uh, <clears throat> the TR69 census 2014. We'll give you the interesting bits of our research story and some technical details. Uh, then we'll continue to show what can only be described as mass ponage. And uh, then conclude talking about why this won't go away so quickly. So TR69. Uh, TR is actually like an RFC, right? TR stands for Technical Report, and this is Technical Report number 69. Um, and this defines the CPE WAN management protocol, which is, uh, CPE is a consumer premises equipment. That would be the home routers that you have at home. And uh, this was, you know, this was released in uh, 2004 by the Broadband Forum, um, which is a group of companies working to define broadband standards. And then there were a few amendments so far, um, but still remember that this was released just 10 years ago. And this is what ISPs use to provision your device. This is what's called the zero touch configuration. Um, it's used to monitor your device for faults or malicious activity and configure anything they want uh, in your home routers, including getting your MAC addresses and host names for anything on your network, creating additional Wi-Fi networks, and go as far as deploying new firmware. Uh, so this is how TR69 sessions or provisioning sessions uh, look like. So on the right side, we have the CPE, right? The, the consumer premises equipment, the TR69 client, that would be your home router. On the left side, we have the TR69 server, which is called an ACS or an auto configuration server. And they talk in basic SOAP RPC, which is XML over HTTP. And it's important to mention that the client always initiates this, the, the connection, um, which is a single TCP connection over which RPCs are called back and forth. So the client begins with, uh, uh, with an inform telling the server why this session was initiated. And the ACS follows with provisioning functions uh, such as get parameter values, 
and set parameter values. It's, it's, it's pretty simple when you think about it. Uh, so there, there is a, uh, a dual authentication mechanism that the CPE should make sure that it's talking to a verified ACS, and the ACS should only accept sessions from authenticated CPEs. And now there, there's, a, there's a slight thing called a connection request that the ACS can issue, and we'll talk about that. So uh, talking about our fighting so far, uh, we presented this at DEF CON 22. Our research uncovered implementation and configuration flaws in many ISPs, um, ACS deployments. So ACSs are a single point of ponage in modern ISP infrastructure. And many TR69 implementations just aren't serious enough. We found vulnerabilities in several products. And that leads to ISP fleet takeover. Exactly. So uh, you remember that connection request thing? And, and this is straight from the TR69 specifications. So the ACS can at any time request that the CPE initiate a connection to the ACS using the, the connection request notification mechanism. Support for this mechanism is required in a CPE, right? So straight from the specification, in fact, every TR69 client in the world is also a connection request server. Um, on which port, you ask? And as, as it turns out, IANA assigned 7547 for all TR69 uses. And, and including the connection request port. And this is a widely used default. And let's, talk at some, uh, let's look on some very interesting research released last year um, from this, uh, the ZMAP guys, which is uh, Zachary Rumerich and, and his friends from University of Michigan. Um, and he's talking like in a, in a couple hours. And they actually scanned 2 million random addresses on every port up to almost 10,000. And they found that CWMP, or the TR69 default port, is in fact the, the second most popular open port in the world, with 1.12% of the internet listening on that port. So again, this is for a protocol that was invented 10 years ago, so think about that. Um, and you know, how many, how many devices are 1.12% uh, you know, out of the public internet? This is around 45 million devices estimated um, that should listen on 7547. You know, from a vulnerability research perspective, this is, uh, and no matter how hard we looked, no one is talking about this service. And there has to be something there. So let's review uh, the top two open ports in the world. So previous research has given us this image. So in port 80, there are around 70 million devices. Um, about 50% of which are web servers. You know, it's regular web servers with Apache leading the bunch. Uh, you got your Nginx, your IIS, and then a small percentage for the rest, um, including, I don't know, Lightspeed and the Google dedicated uh, servers. And the other 50% are, are simply the, those Internet of Things devices, right? Most of them are routers. You got your webcams, you got your uh, voice over IP phones. And of course, let's not forget about all the IPv4 enabled toasters out there. <laughs> uh, so by the way, people start understanding that leaving these things open to the WAN is dangerous. You know, luckily, we're seeing more and more devices updated to have port 80 access um, on the LAN only. Now, remember uh, that not only there is diversity in the server software, it's also being used for different uses, serving, I mean, serving websites, all sorts of cloud services, and then management interfaces for each device. You know, it's a messy landscape. But looking at port 7547, you know, we have an estimated 45 million devices, and these are all Internet of Things devices, you know, listening on their connection request port. There's nothing else there. It's just devices waiting for connection requests. You know, so this landscape is much clearer. And, and, and remember, we're looking for security issues here. Um, and we're looking to find, you know, significant numbers affected. So as a, first, as a first step, we needed to stop guessing and estimated, and estimating. Uh, so we conducted the TR69 census 2014. And, uh, you know, we scanned 7547 on the entire uh, IPv4 address space. And we did this uh, last month, uh, a few times actually, with the, with the gracious help of some good friends over at Rapid7 and University of Michigan who contributed, contributed to this research, so thanks guys. <clears throat> and the results are, 
1.18% of the public internet responds on port 7547. So we actually communicated with 46,093,733 devices who answered our benign requests for get slash. Um, so these are all over the world, and, and it's not just you know, one country who accidentally left this port open. It's 189 countries, um, which makes sense when you remember you know, it's a protocol requirement to leave this port open open for the ACS. Um, and, and just a small note, note that the, the, um, the 0.06% increase from last year is actually 2.2 million devices added in a year, which is you know, showing us a nice trend, and numbers are still on the rise. So we're set on finding an issue with TR69 client-side implementations. And the natural thing to do at this point is look at what implementations we're seeing out there. So uh, we categorize the responses and sum up the numbers, and we get this. Um, so we have five main connection request servers out there, but it's very clear that this thing called ROM pager you know, is leading the pack. And I think that means that we uh, got ourselves a target. <laughs> so what is Rompager? Uh, it's an embedded HTTP server by Allegro Software. It's a Massachusetts-based uh, based company. It's optimized for minimal environments. Uh, it's a small binary, small memory requirements. Uh, it was first introduced in 1996. And you know, just, there's been many versions since. The current version is 5.4. Um, but then, you know, now that we've decided that we're going after this front pager, we need to see what versions are out there. And this will help us focus our efforts. So we run the short script again, and you know, we actually see just four different ROM pages, uh, ROM pager versions out there. You know, when you'd expect this sort of uh, normal distribution of these versions in the wild. And, and instead, we get this. So 98.04% so of the identified devices are version 4.07, which is a pretty old version, too. So, you know, this is where I grew suspicious, right? <laughs> I mean, what can explain this incredible popularity of a single version? You know, could it be like a batch of old devices at a single ISP or something, which is we just don't know it yet, um, and this really piques our interest, so we have to find out. So uh, we went ahead and we bought a new, uh, new TP-Link router, and we, we unbox it, we plug it in, we connect it to our network, uh, you know, and it's running Rompager 407. So we thought, you know, you know, maybe this is an old version of the device, you know, it's, it has such like an old version of Rompager. So, we, we, we downloaded the latest firmware from the TP-Link website. You know, we flash it, we reboot, and it's still Rompager 407. So, I mean, <laughs> what? Um, you know, at this point, we start understanding uh, the popularity of the 4. Point, I mean, the 407 version. I mean, we have no idea why it's there uh, yet, but. Uh, but if it's somehow embedded into brand new devices off the shelf, you know, with the most recent firmware, then that can certainly explain, you know, why we're seeing so many of them. Uh, but let's try something here. Um, does anyone in the audience happen to have an unopened brand new router? Anyone? Oh, oh, what a coincidence. <laughs> what a coincidence. Thank you. Thank you, Virgin. Thank you very much. Oh, wow. I... Thank you, kind stranger. I'd, you're very nice. You, you don't work for me at all. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, going, to, I'm going to do something with that later. <laughs> OK, so you know, we dive into this uh, ROM pager 407. And this, this was released 2002. <clears throat> so you know, it seems to run a whole bunch of devices. And you know, we return to our scan data, and we start counting. And so we have 2.2 um, million devices uh, serving Rompager 07 on port 80, and 11.3 million devices 
on port 7547. And, you know, suddenly we're like, you know, wait, there are 12 million devices out there with this very specific version, you know, of a web server that was released in 2002 listening on the WAN. Yeah, I mean, yes, this is like, this is the perfect vulnerability research candidate. <laughs> <clears throat> and, you know, zooming out for a moment, uh, this is, to the best of our knowledge, the most popular specific version of any network application service currently available online on the public internet. Um, you know, this specific version is deployed on 200 different devices from 50 different brands. Uh, you know, we are going to do whatever it takes to pwn Rampage, Rampager 407. Let me, hand, let me hand it over to Lior. Okay. Oh. So, hi. Uh, my name is Dior, and I will walk you through the process of how I analyze the ROM pager as firmware and some uh, interesting results I found on the way. So, at the beginning, I only have the firmware file uh, itself, which was downloaded from the vendor uh, website. In our case, it was TP-Link. Uh, on first glance, uh, the firmware file is looking like a big blob of compressed data. And as any rookie firmware analyst knows, the first the first thing you need to do is to binwalk, binwalk your firmware. Binwalk is this great to tool developed by DevTTYS0, which recognizes and unpacks most of the common firmware files. So luckily for us, uh, binwalk easily recognized and extra extracted four files. So we have the bootloader, we have the vendor logo in the GIF images, and the main binary. So after I got the first firmware, I decided to download some more firmware which contained ROM pager uh, 407. So I downloaded some more, and some more, and some more, and I see that each and every one of them had the same XenOS header and also the same ar architecture, which was MIPS. So while this ROM pager 407 looks so similar, uh, at this point, I have no idea whatsoever. Uh, so. One may, may ask himself, what is this XenOS uh, we are seeing in all the firmware? So XenOS is uh, an embedded OS created by Zixel, which is a major Taiwanese DSL vendor. Uh, XenOS is an RTOS, a real-time OS, which means it's a very basic operating system without any file system or permissions mechanism. Just one big binary file responsible for everything. When you Google up XenOS, you also see that XenOS is very notoriously known for the ROM zero vulnerability discovered last year, which allowed an attacker to gain the router credentials by downloading the entire, uh, the entire, uh, sorry, by downloading the entire configuration file from the router without any author authorization. All it takes is for the web panel to be open in port 80. And uh, an attacker just simply gained the password and, and the username. And 1.2 million devices were affected by this vulnerability. Well, this is a lot. So before we start analyzing the firmware itself, let's see what our attack surface looks like. So in port 80, uh, we are getting an unauthorized response, which asks us to, for the credential. And since we don't know them, we are getting this instead. In port 7, a 547, we are getting object not found for any path except for the cor correct connection request path. For now, uh, we assume that we do not know the cor correct path. So before I actually started to dive into the code, I did some basic fuzzing over the HTTP headers. Suddenly, I managed to crash the router by sending a digest username, by overflowing the digest username header, which led me to the first vulnerability. So to understand why this is happening, let's explore some of ROM pager code. When you see, uh, what you see here is a function responsible for initializing the HTTP handler structure. Each entry consists of the HTTP header name, as you can see here, and the relevant handler function to parse this header. So let's take a look on the function that parses the digest username. So can you see what caused the vulnerability? Yes, an unprotected strcpy. But what actually caused the router to crash, uh, because we have no symbol and no dynamic analysis capability whatsoever, it's very difficult to know. 
So because we, I had no dynamic analysis capabilities, I, start, I open up the router and start looking for JTAG. So for those of you who don't know, JTAG is this interface uh, designed to do hard, hardware verification and debugging for embedded devices. So I opened up the router, but I couldn't find any JTAG connectors. Uh, but I did find something that looked like a serial port, a, a UR port. So uh, I did some soldiering and uh, connected, uh, connected to the router itself and used Bus Pirate, which is a USB, serial to USB uh, adapter to connect it to my computer. And uh, when, I boot up, when I boot up the router, I could see some very nice debugging info. So it was very cool. But what happens when I try to crash the router? So this is what I got. A very nice looking crash dump. With, you see here the mute registers and the stack dump. And also on the, on the top, you can see this one. This is the EPC, which is the MIPS instruction pointer. As you can see here, it was uh, overwritten with my input. That, that this, is mean, this means that we actually in control of the instruction pointer. Yeah. So uh, some further analysis of the crash dump allowed me to fully understand the vulnerability. So the STRCPY caused us to overwrite a function pointer, which conveniently lays 584 hexabytes before, after the username. So exploiting this is pretty simple. Just send out the username, override the function pointer with a pointer to your shell code, and you can run remote code, and you have a remote code execution. So it sounds way too easy. Any problems? So yeah, we have a slight problem. Although, although all the vulnerable uh, firmware, firmware are XenOS based, each one is looked a bit different in terms of uh, memory layout. And it even changes between different firmware versions of the same model. This means we, uh, we cannot know the correct position of our shellcode in the memory. And therefore, we don't know with which value we need to overwrite the function pointer. Uh, of course, if you knew the uh, sorry. Of course, if you knew the exact memory layout of your victim, you can easily uh, run code on his router without, without any problem. Uh, it's also important to know that uh, once an attacker uh, an attacker has only one chance to attack a router because if it causes a crash, then the router gets a new IP because of the dynamic IP allocation. So a potential solution solution for this whole problem would be just to find uh, some infolic vulnerability that would disclose the memory layout. But it seemed like way too much work for now, so let just, let's keep looking for something else. So because I had no way of debugging, I had to use some very primitive debugging capabilities that were, were built into ROM pager, uh, into the bootloader through the serial port, which allowed me to patch the firmware before it was being loaded. So it was very handy, but very tedious process. Uh, so after way too many hard resets, I found that there is a hidden telnet command in XenOS, which lets you patch uh, the router memory online. So this led to the creation of Zordon, which is a XenOS remote debugger over the net. And uh, with Zordon, you can uh, set breakpoints, view and edit memory, and also read and write register value online. This made the dynamic analysis uh, way more convenient. So using my brand new debugger, I was able to understand much better the nuts and bolts of a uh, Rompager, which eventually, eventually led me to the second vulnerability. You see, Rompager has no dynamic memory allocation capabilities. So each requ request is handled in a pre-allocated structure uh, without, with, without up to three requests handled at the same time. So if you send three consecutive requ requests, you can override the HTTP handler structure, which we saw earlier. This is also caused by an unprotected STL-CPY. So again, we, we can control over the uh, EPC. So can it be exploited? Well, theoretically, you can blindly uh, do a memory read uh, of ad address me uh, memory addresses by changing the pointer of some HTTP header name. but it, I, at the end, I decided to leave this vulnerability because it only works on port 80, and we already have ROM0 for that. So moving on to vulnerability number three. So ROM pager supports cookies. Because ROM pager, as, as you remember, does not have any uh, dynamic memory allocation, it's held an internal cookies array for each request without 10 cookies uh, at the array and up to 40 bytes long each, uh, each cookie. 
uh, the cookie names are constant. So it's C0, C9, C1, C2, up to C9. Um, and the client, this is a, an example of a client sending one of these cookies. You can see here the C0 cookie. So let's take a look uh, on the cookie handler to see how ROM pager actually store the cookies. So you can see here on the top that ROM pager checks uh, the, cookie, uh, the cookie name for a capital C at the beginning. If so, then it will convert the rest of the cookie name into an integer and use this integer as an index for the cookie array. Okay, <laughs> so yeah, it will it will load a, a, it will uh, multiply S, S3, which is the index by 40, and then use it as a destination for the STR and CPY. Yep. <laughs> so here you can see more easily. So basically, this gives me an arbitrary memory write, uh, write for a re from a relative uh, position in the ROM pager internal structure which means we can pretty much control everything a ROM pager does. So a very nice bonus is that we can overflow the 32-bit integer to get to a negative offsets in the structure. So let's take a look on some, on non, on some non harmful uh, cookie. Instead of C0 or C1, we are sending this. Uh, with the, the index is pointing exactly at the request, request path field. We can see that uh, we can now set this path to anything we like, and in this case, we'll get this. So we were able to overwrite the request path with our own uh, input. Uh, but this actually has far worse consequences. So I I'll need to mention this technique will work on any model, on any brand that we had legal access to. You see, with the, a few magic cookies added to your request, you can bypass authentication and browse the, the configuration interface as admin from any port. So to prove this insane claim, let's go straight to the demo. Sorry? No, wait a sec. I'll fix it. Yes, we are ready, we are psyched. Next. Yes. Okay, so uh, we actually have a video recorded, and then we're going to try the live demo. Uh, we prayed to the demo gods earlier, so hopefully um, things will work there as well. But first, let's look at the demo that will really, I think, explain the issue here. Right. So uh, we enter the router. It shows us, you know, username, password, login. Um, we can also try to see what's available on 7547. Of course, we get the object not found. Then we use our Chrome plugin. <laughs> <clears throat> and <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's actually try this live and, and really hope that it works. Let's see now. We've got, all right, so we get the authentication required. Oh, you're not seeing that? Wait a sec. There you go. Well, it's, it's a bit small, but still. So we're getting the authentication required. We're gonna go to the Misfortune Cookie Auto Poner. And try that again. See if it works. Hopefully it works. It doesn't. Oh, wait a sec, wait a sec. We're going to try that again. No, it's like an internal thing. Don't worry about it. Oh, it doesn't matter what port we are. <laughs> Will this work? Yeah. Thank you. 
So again, you know, this is, you know, this, this is what we got at this store. This is brand new. This is a device that was manufactured 2014. This is uh, very interesting. Okay, so back to our presentation. Um, we set up this nice website, and it explains kind of, of, of the core issue here. And then we try to see which countries were affected by this. And, you know, again, this vulnerability affects devices in 189 countries all over the world. And in some countries, this is incredibly popular, affecting up to 50% of the IP addresses in use in that country. I'm not joking, that's one out of every two IP addresses in that country are vulnerable to this. And that's, that's a few countries and certainly some big names in, in, in the country list that you didn't expect to see there. Yeah, <laughs> Smarf is happy about that as well. I know what you're thinking. I have to turn this off on my device right now. I should not have 7547 listening on my, you know, on my public IP address. And as soon as you'll get home, you know, you'll enter your configuration interface and you'll find the CWMP settings, you know, and, and, and you'll deactivate it. And you'll hit save. And it doesn't do anything because port 7547 is still open. That's right, there is no legitimate way for you to turn this off even as admin. I don't know if to laugh or to cry, I don't know. So what can you do? You can cancel your internet subscription. Um, of course, I mean, the technical users, hopefully, that, that's you guys. You can flash alternative firmware. Um, so you have you know, both DDWRT and OpenWRT, which, are, which you just don't have ROM pagers, so you can take your chances on whatever they have there. Um, but it's not the, the, you know, the old version of ROM pager. And you know, don't buy these models until they're fixed. And the suspected vulnerable model list is on the website, and we uh, occasionally update that. <clears throat> All right, so, so let's, understand, you know, let's understand the supply chain here. Um, AllegroSoft provided ROM pager at one point to a certain chipset vendor. And this chipset vendor implemented the TR69 functionality and bundled this into their SDK as a bonus feature. Um, now, this SDK was provided to manufacturers who compiled their firmwares you know, for each product series and model. And just to make it a bit more complicated, the ISPs customized the firmware to include brand logos, you know, default configurations, and deploy these versions to consumer devices. So you can start to and, and, you know, understand this this incredibly com complex behind-the-scenes chain. And think about what this means for security updates. Because uh, the update propagation chain here is incredibly slow, if not non-existent. AllegroSoft has to provide a fixed version to the chipset vendor, which then has to incorporate this into the SDK, which has to be given to manufacturers who have to recompile firmwares for every product line and every product model which have to give it to ISPs, which have to recompile it, the, you know, to, to recompile the firmwares and the updated version using their, their customization. And now this thing has to be deployed on every device. This is a nightmare. And, you know, in this, in this case, we can truly say that too many cooks do spoil the broth. And thank you. So, you know, you know, this is the good case we're describing here because, you know, we're, 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 your, your device is controlled by your ISP. Because if you just bought your home router off the shelf, you know, most people never upgrade their router firmware. And, uh, you know, anyway, this, this vulnerability will be here for months and years to come. So, vendor communication. Uh, we contacted uh, Allegro Soft and all the major affected vendors. Um, we provided full description of the vulnerability and a non-harmful um, POC to trigger it. You know, despite some broken English, uh, the message did get, get through. 
at least most of the time. Uh, we have some patched firmware already out, at least from, uh, from Huawei, uh, who actually, they were, uh, they were the best responders so far. They have very clear communication. Um, and, you know, AllegroSoft released a, a statement saying that, you know, we can't force any vendor to upgrade to, their, to the latest version, and we actually provided a patched version in 2005. So think about this. If code from 2005 still did not make it through the chain, and we actually know it did not make it even one step into the chain, uh, something is wrong here. So just a few very frequently asked questions that we've been getting in the week that this is out. You know, uh, is Rampager bad? No. Uh, you know, they were actually very responsive. They were security aware. They caught this bug in an internal co uh, code review. They, ju they just uh, didn't know what it meant. When we explained it to them, they were, I, I know, they were, I heard the jaws drop over the phone line. Um, <laughs> And, you know, we just happened to research an old version of their software. It's, I think it's any code written in 2002 might have been, you know, uh, uh, secured the same. And, you know, we don't think this is an intentionally placed backdoor. Uh, it doesn't look like one. Uh, we will not be sharing the exploit. Uh, no, I'm sorry about that. Um, you know, a lot, some third bodies have, have approached me and, and they're, they're asking about, you know, the IPs that are affected in their country, and I'm saying, you know, you have to scan it yourself. Um, and and listen, the numbers here are lying because some ISPs actually, you know, don't use the default TR69 port. They use something else. I mean, at least we know that in Israel we use something else. Um, and when you scan in these ports, you get very different numbers. So that's an important uh, point to mention. Uh, short recap. We found a pretty serious vulnerability in the most popular service exposed in IPv4. At least as far as we know, um, do challenge us if you think otherwise. And uh, hey, industry, fix this. Thank you very much. Uh, would love to have your questions. Well, thank you so yes. much. Actually, I had the honor to mediate a similar lecture this morning at 11.30 by an Irishman who showed us that the switches that the main energy providers, actually you can just download the image and upload it when you've patched it into the ROM. <laughs> this is a bit more complicated, but it's basically yeah. the same thing. Actually, it scares the shit out of me. It's, you should be scared. Okay, we'll be taking questions. Yes, I can please. know. Oops, la. That you guys want to know. So we'll do one, two, one, two. Is that okay with you? Okay, here yeah. you go, number one. Okay, so um, I'd like to know a bit more about uh, ZenOS because at home I have. Uh, can you people please, when you leave, leave quietly? Some people still want to listen. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I have that uh, D-Link DSL320B, which is in your list. And I started to poke into it because it's quite crap. And uh, it runs the Linux. But it looks like before it runs the Linux, it runs something else, which has a drop bear. And I'd like to know if it matches the OS, if it's some kind of pre-Linux OS, or how does it work? OK, so first. Uh, we don't know that device because we don't have access to every single device that we saw on the list, oh. right? We didn't, we didn't try to exploit everything on the internet. Uh, only thing, devices that we could have legal access to. Um, we'd be, I mean, we would love to talk about this later. And if you can share some details with us, then maybe we can look into this. Uh, you, but we don't have anything to add about this. I'm sorry. Now, um, just is it maybe compatible that it's the device starts ZenOS, which then starts Linux? Do you know? No, sorry, I, I don't know. Okay. We Thanks. haven't seen this device, sorry. Thank God. Okay, thank you. Um, there's somebody waiting at mic two. Go ahead. When you originally published this issue as Misfortune Cookie, yes. you recommended to home users to install Zone Alarm as a protective measure That's on right. their end computers. 
could you explain how installing a personal firewall would protect me from root opponage? First of all, I can definitely explain how this helps if your router gets pwned, but it's definitely not what I want to talk about. Um, and we can, we can talk about this later if you'd like. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, okay. more questions. Okay, next question, uh, Mike One. Uh, you mentioned the uh, affected IP address list for countries. Please, can, you have, can we have some quiet, please? I'm you sorry. mentioned getting the list of the affected IP addresses for a country. Uh, just one request, please talk to the Shadow Server Foundation because they have the daily methods of scanning for exactly these kind of issues and send out the list of affected IP addresses to all national servers all over the world. So, so I didn't please. get the, the part you talking Shadow Server Foundation. We can talk later. Okay, so talk mm -hmm. to you later, sure. Yes, more questions. Okay, please. we'll stick to the mic. No, there is nobody. Is there somebody over there? Oh, I come up front. Mm. Oh. Do I look that scary? No. Do they look that scary? It's us, it's us. I mean, to you yes, folks. Uh, okay, you, go ahead. You, you, yeah, no. Um, um, did you... Thank you. And speak into the mic, please. <laughs> yes. Um, did you check cable modems? Because at least here in Germany, we are forced to use the modems we get by our providers. Mm -hmm. And especially uh, models like the Technicolors are very well known for horrible exploits. Mm -hmm. Like you can force them to reboot with a broken HTTP GET, which is like kind of scary. <laughs> yeah, uh, so we, we, we didn't try to categorize um, according to, you know, cable or, or um, DSL or whatever it is. If it's on the suspected vulnerable model list, then we saw it as, you know, as vulnerable as containing ROM pager 407. That's a very simple check to make. Uh, okay, because I'm just asking because I have no possibility to switch as long as I stick to this ISP. So I, I understand that it's definitely a problem that we're seeing in other places uh, uh, worldwide, and you know this is a part of why we're doing this, a part of why we're doing this publication. We think that this puts a very positive pressure on many many vendors out there to fix to fix this as fast as possible. You know we're, we're we are seeing that that this process is being expedited. So definitely in cases like this, if this is vulnerable please go and talk to your providers and tell them this is a very, very serious security issue and you have to deal with this now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, hang on a minute. Um, we have questions from the internet. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> because we've been streaming. So can we have a question from the internet, please? Yes, yeah, uh, there's a question. Uh, have to try to uh, propone a GSOP. If not, are you going to? GSOP. No, we, we did not try it. Uh, it's definitely, it's definitely a research direction. Uh, anyone can take it up. We recommend that you do so. Okay. Uh, should I not do not request? Not. We'll have one more question from okay. the internet and then go back oh. to Mike one. And uh, wouldn't it be, be possible to uh, to use the exploit to, exp to exploit the water router and then update them? To exploit the what? Sorry. To exploit the router and then update them using the exploit. Oh, oh exploit the router and then and then uh, upload. <laughs> yeah, okay. And then upload new firmware. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Mike one, I think was it? Yeah. Yep. Hi there. Uh, yeah. Very good talk. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, so obviously the vendors are going to take a very long time to fix this. But is there any really legitimate use of this port seven? Four, five, four, seven. Um, yes. From outs, yeah, yeah. Surely within the ISP's network, but over the network, is there any real use for this? Is this something that ISPs could, you know, filter at their border, for example? Um, they they use it all the time to do all sorts of monitoring and configuration issues. So if you block your seven five four seven, uh, if you magically block it somehow, right? Because a lot of a lot of the times you you don't even have this option. But if you do block it, then they won't be able to help you with anything. They won't be able to see if anything's wrong with your device. But is this something that ISPs can fix and stop the entire IPv4 so, space from? Yeah, I mean, we released a, a protection white paper um, that's intended for providers, you know, with some, some good advice on how to solve this. For example, just a, a real, you know, a, a small taste of it. Um, you could use an internal IP range um, to to uh, you know to have this uh, the seven five four seven 
uh, listen on, and then you don't really have to put it on the public WAN. Uh, so that's, I mean, we're, we're seeing some providers definitely do that, and that's a very good direction for some. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, you queue up back. Um, mic number two, your go. Yeah. Can we please have some peace? You want to chat? Okay, go outside. If I can just respond to the previous question, I'm working for an ISP, and what you can actually do is just set an access list on those modems, so only the legitimate I, uh, ACS can reach those modems. That's the simplest thing you can do as an ISP. Yeah, we all. I think we also mentioned that in the production okay. paper, and thank you yeah. for that. Um, second question is, are you aware of the research that was presented at uh, Hack in the Box Amsterdam 2013 in April? Because I think they actually... Oh, I hacked your modem, yes. Yeah, because I think they actually hit the same buffer overflow there. Um, same buffer overflow? No, it was a different version of a ROM pager in a Zixel uh, runner, yeah. I think. It's a, it's a very... Uh, we are kind of the same, but it's de very different vulnerability. Okay, you checked. Okay, just wanted to know. Thank Thanks. You. Okay, thank you. Move over to mic one. Uh, uh, Talking to the mic. Talk okay. to the mic. I have to record you for the stream. <laughs> Sorry. Have you looked into impact of um, what would happen if someone changed all the DNS settings if it was to, to a fake DNS? Or changed everyone's SSID name and things like that, or just generally played havoc with people's letters? Yeah, uh, well, well, definitely. Uh, that's kind of what we're seeing in, in the past few years. Attackers doing in, in large, you know, high-profile router attacks. They they change the DNS settings, and it's pretty much game over from there. So definitely, that's also an opening for that. Um, you know, we really hope that attackers, you know, don't get a hold of this. But um, it's definitely, I think it will happen eventually. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Here so we go again. I have several questions. So first question, which is support in Israel? So if I'm on holiday, maybe it's interesting. And uh, uh, so what's the support in Israel? Uh, I'm sorry, again, the question? The port for this thing in Israel. Oh, the port in Israel. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about that later. I don't want to <laughs> give okay. out, you know, uh, good details. Okay, and then the second thing is, uh, I have, for example, have an evil ISP who gives me a Fritz box. Yep. And the problem is that uh, I cannot uh, switch, uh, I cannot get my access data, and I cannot um, uh, own this thing because I would then need to, need to have a high-speed modem to, to go to the left side where it is connected to the fiber, um, fiber optic mm -hmm. um, thing that uh, generates this coax cable um, DSL stuff mm -hmm. via maybe 20 meters. And so I need, need to do a sniffing device that goes there. It's, it's a real problem. I, we can understand that. It's definitely one of the things that make this issue so serious. Uh, OK, so, no so how, how do I build a sniffing device? So is there maybe a, a device that I can exploit and say, OK, I, I buy a DSL modem and build a special sniffing, and so maybe a double, double modem device. Yeah, so but, I can then, but then it's kind of, you know, it's not going to be for the mass market. So no, but, but I won't want to hack my Fritz box, and then I know it, and then <laughs> it's, it's better for me than I can use something else. I guess uh, there are a few people here at 31C3 that could help you build that <coughs> thing. OK. And then with cable modems, if you do it with cable modem, it would be much more fun because a cable is flat. So even if I don't have a subscribe to a cable device, I can just go into my flat, have a cable outlet, go to a flea market, buy a cable modem, I scan, I scan the internet for some cable modem in the city and dump the memory put, put the access data of this person into my cable modem and I can have it for free. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> How they catch me? It's 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 flat. It's just <laughs> passive um, networks like 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 damping. Uh, I mean, yeah, we definitely we're seeing a lot of these, uh, you know, a lot of, of these uh, home router threats, and it's definitely one uh, one that we're also looking into um, and the cable modems right now. So hopefully for next CCC. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay, but we'll keep trying. Okay. Yes. Mic number one. Yeah. Is it correct that via TR69, the providers can also change this default port? So yeah, that they yes. can send you a new configuration? Yes. And so they could, on the very first provisioning of the box, when I just connect, take it out and connect it to my DSL, uh, that I get immediately from the ACS a new port, which is not the default port anymore? Very possible and actually being done. Okay. So then uh, I would be vulnerable, of course, 
on, on the, the other same port. Bot right. So, uh, I mean, uh, but we also recommended that some ISPs do that because at least you're going to get away from the opportunistic hackers that just scan the entire internet. Mm. Okay. I don't know who would do such a thing, but... Yeah. Uh. <laughs> In, uh, maybe regarding your statistics, Germany was quite light colored. Yeah. Um, is it because you've uh, scanned only that port or did you scan... Uh, We scan only the... scanned 7547, it's important to mention. All of our numbers are based on 7547. If you, know, you go into the depth of each country, of each ISP, you can potentially find a lot more <laughs> vulnerable devices. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. I, and if anyone does this, please do share it with us uh, uh, because you know, we might make this public and, and help your provider fix this. Okay, now you all people know that if you want to go back and look at this talk, you'll find it on the internet in our stream archive just before you get panic. Number two, please. Okay, um, I didn't quite get how the protocol actually works. Mm -hmm. is the listening, why is the listening service on the client side actually required? Because you said every uh, communication is initiated by the client. And why? Yeah, well, first service? of all, you understand that this vulnerability has almost nothing to do with TR69. It doesn't have yeah. anything to do with the protocol. It's just a web server that's listening on this port because of TR69. And so just uh, mentioning again what I said at the beginning that Uh, uh, this is a connection request port that ACS can send connection requests to, which the client immediately follows by, you know, okay. making a new connection okay. and okay. A, a real provisioning session. Okay, that's it. Okay. Yeah, and this is you know XML over HTTP, so this is an HTTP server. Okay, before they shut down the internet, there is this question. <laughs> yes, from the internet. Yes. What is with the newer versions? Are they really fixed? The new versions are, are, have been fixed. We, um, some some uh, uh, vendors have provided us with you know beta versions of firmware of fixed firmware, and they actually fixed it right. I mean, at least as we see it, uh, they're checking it correctly, and they fixed the buffer overflows, and um, you know just patched it actually on. ROM pager 407, they just patched these vulnerabilities. So there might be more things there. Um, and also, just an interesting point here, that would make it a bit difficult to understand if a device is now still vulnerable because the server header is still going to be 4.07. And then you'd have to find like a different way of figuring out if this is vulnerable. Yes. Okay. Some more? No child left behind. Yes. We answer all questions. Yes. There are more, more questions. Uh, how about IP46, to, uh, IP46 devices using dual stack light? I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. How about, how about IP46 devices using dual stack light? Dual stack? Oh, I'd, we did not look into that at all. Sorry. <laughs> okay, was they all, that was it? Anybody else a question? You guys want to ask a question? No? Okay, well then let's have one big final hand. Thank you.